There is something that I have had on my heart and I was kind of leaving it and leaving it and then after our meeting before coming to the to the auditorium uh, I felt maybe I should say something about it tonight. And before the musicians sit down, I am going to direct my thoughts this evening to everyone, but especially to those of you between the ages of 20 and 45. There are <clears throat> scriptures which I just can't lay my finger on and I don't want to take the time in that area in a way that, that speaks concerning those that are 20 years of age upward. And I would like all in the auditorium tonight, young men and young women alike, married or single, I would like you to stand, please. Everyone between the ages of 20 and 45. That excludes the front row. Praise God. That's a wonderful sight. Don't be ashamed of being 20 years old or 45 either. But before the, the musicians sit down, we were singing a few moments ago concerning God's will. Teach me your way. Stay up. How would you like to stand up here for the next two hours? <clears throat> but we were singing, teach me your way. I would like you to sing that tonight, as I'd like to speak a little bit about that, about the will of God concerning you. So if you will, please, prayerfully sing it. Teach me your way. Make it the prayer of your heart as you sing it. Praise God. Teach Raise your hands and sing it again.
everybody sing it together once again. Establish us further in thy ways and unveil before us the desires of thine heart and impart unto us grace, O God, and strength that we might fulfill that which is thy will concerning us all. We are thankful for these young men and women that stand before thee tonight. Father, we know that great responsibility shall rest upon them. And may the preparations of our hearts be such, O God, that thou might to the fullest advantage use these vessels of clay that thy will may be accomplished in each and every one of us. Be with us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. I would like to begin, I'm not going to read too many scriptures tonight, which is a little break from my way of ministering. But I would like you to turn to the third chapter of Revelation for a few moments. I am sure that we are all aware of the fact that we have come to a time in the affairs of God and of man when he is beginning to speak to us in no uncertain terms. I was very, very much impressed and thrilled last night when the prophecies went forth to India If my memory serves me right, a similar prophecy went forth like that when we were in Africa. I believe that God has brought us to a time when he is speaking to us about specific things. Those prophecies last night could have been given 
And if India had not been named, I suppose they could have fit, in a sense, every nation on the earth. But God, by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, and by prophetic utterance, spoke to India. I believe that God is speaking in a specific way to every one of us in this auditorium this evening. In this third chapter of Revelation, we will read from the seventh verse. It says, And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, and he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all of the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, let no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him a, na a new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I say to you tonight, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying unto the church in 1985. Hallelujah. I may come back to that. But turn now, if you will, to Matthew, the 17th chapter. <coughs> Matthew 17, and verse beginning to read at... I'm sorry, it's chapter 16. It didn't seem right. Chapter 16, verse 21. From that time forth, Jesus began, Jesus, to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him, and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. 
Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that are of men. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is it a prophet, pardon me, for what is a man prophet if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Hallelujah. The particular verse that seemed to rest upon my heart for the last two or three days is what Jesus said. If any man shall come or follow after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We have been told by prophetic utterance since coming to these meetings that there is before us an open door. I have fought, and I'm sure all of you have, I have fought and I have asked God concerning that open door. And I suppose there are many things that could be involved in this open door. But I would like to especially speak to you young men and women at a door of opportunity that is before you tonight as children of God. We were taught many years ago, maybe some of you weren't even born yet, but we were told, I believe by, again, prophetic utterance, that your ministry was your cross. And that is true, just as true tonight, if not more so than it was then. Many of you that stood this evening, some of you already are elders. Some of you are already are deacons. You bear the responsibility of the flock of God. To me, it is like one of the highest callings and the greatest honor that could be, be bestowed upon any human being to be called of God to fulfill a ministry that is appointed by the Holy Ghost. It is something that we should revere and honor with dignity and respect. It is something that the Word of God teaches us that we should desire above all else that we may fulfill that which God has ordained for our lives. Some of you young people tonight will be elders one day. I am sure of that. 
I don't know who you are. And at this point, it, that really doesn't matter. Some of you, dear young women, will be elders' wives. Some of you, young men, will be deacons in the local church. Some of you, young women, will be uh, deacons' uh, wives of those that hold the often office of a deacon. With those offices comes a great responsibility before God. And excuse me, I am built this way and sometimes I wished I wasn't. But I wonder sometimes, young people, and please hear me, I wonder if you are ready to receive the responsibility that comes with such an office. It requires dedication. It requires separation. It requires a devotion unto God. Far beyond, I am sure, we ever realize. We are beginning to realize as brethren and elders of the, of the church universal, as traveling deacons, as local elders, as local deacons, we are beginning to realize the weight and the responsibility that God has entrusted to such human mortals as we. But I want you to be prepared to go in to the, through this open door. Take up thy cross. And follow me. What will it require? It will require much. As I have mentioned it requires a dedication. It requires separation. It requires sometimes you being in that in that sort of a peculiar group that are misfits in the world systems of today. I want you to know, dear young people and all of us here tonight, there is absolutely no way that the systems of this transitory age in which we live can have part nor parcel of the church of the living God. If ever God is calling out and separating a people unto himself, it is the hour in which you and I sit tonight in God's presence. You will be strange. You will be odd. There was a man came once clothed in, in a piece of animals, rawhide, eating locusts and wild honey that, that came to herald the message of the coming of Jesus Christ. They thought he was an absolute nothing fool. But he was ordained of God to make the preparation that men might receive him. I am sure even in this age, if some man came to you and I, clothed in a piece of hide off of a, off of a deer or something, and all he ate was honey, I, you would say he was a Hannigan. <laughs> I do not believe that you need to be uh, just uh, sort of misfits altogether. But there comes a time, my dear brother, sister, it was prophesied the other night, and someone said, if somebody had stood up, I'd have stood with them. It was prophesied that the time has come when we must stand up and be counted. God wants to separate unto himself a people in order that we can go in through this open door. Hallelujah. I'll tell you, there'll be a screening process. I don't want to put damnation on anyone, but maybe it'll be all right if I put a little of the fear of God in your heart. Take up thy cross and follow me. Your cross is your ministry. I am sure there are elders within the sound of my voice tonight 
that have had to deprive their family of many things because of the office they hold. How many times has it happened when you had had arranged a little outing with your family? Maybe you were going to the lake or you were going for a picnic or you were going to do something. And that invention of Graham Bell, he'd have to have a name like Graham, rang. And one of the sheep were sick. And they'd call for the elders of the church. You had to deprive your children and your wife of that outing because of the responsibility that God had set upon you as an elder. Choose you this day whom you will serve. When one needs to make such a choice, we must make the right choice. I am sure that we are confronted, and I know you dear young people are confronted, I suppose practically every day of your life you are challenged. Your morals are challenged. Your standards are challenged. It is so easy to let down. It is so easy to get caught in the current, and as one of the brethren said, to be squeezed into this mold system. It is so easy to drift with a crowd. But it takes a lot of spiritual stamina and intestinal fortitude in order to stand and face the crowd and go the way that God wants you to go. Take up thy cross and follow me. How many times have you deacons had other things in mind when God required your services? Take up thy cross and follow me. It may appear on the surface That being, I'll use the word for lack of a better, a traveling ministry, whether it be the brethren here or the traveling deacons, it may appear on the surface as though it is very glamorous. I remember the first time I was leaving this continent, I'd never been off of it. I was going to the West Indies. And I was making preparations to go getting all these needles stuck in you and what all they have to do to you in order for you to go. And I was talking to somebody and I, somehow they, we got on the subject and I, they asked what I was doing or where I was going, so I told them, oh my, that must be wonderful. There was only wonder, one wonderful thing I could think of and that was 300 Ninth Street East. There wasn't anything that appealed to me. Excuse me, brethren, where are you? There wasn't anything appealed to me about the Caribbean except the call of God. I remember sitting in an elders and deacons meeting in the Caribbean. And Brother Wager seems to always get the breaks. He had the ladies to talk to, and I had the men. But we were having a kind of an open time, and if they had any questions or problems, that we would try and help them with them as much as possible. And I'll never forget this man, and I believe he did it in sincerity. He stood up, and he had a few things to say. And then he said this, I'll never forget it if I live to be as old as Methuselah, and I hope I do. I'm a little old. But he said, right in the sort of the context of what he was saying, he said, well, what I am really trying to say is this, what I'd really like to be is a traveling ministry. And I just happened to turn, and Brother Miller was sitting on the end of a a bench, 
and he just about fell right off the end of the bench on the floor. I thought to myself, dear man, you do not know what you're asking for. There is nothing glamorous about it. Listen, young people. There's a cross that must be born. We are living in a different age. It seems that there are so many things that are different. You young ladies, God bless you. We love you. We love you young men too. Better put that in or I'm in trouble. But there are there are, there is something that I, I want you to hear tonight. Just perchance. God might have his eye on your husband. There could come a time in your life when you won't see that hubby of yours for weeks on end. I remember being in conversation once where a young woman was complaining about her husband being away for three days. I asked her, in kindly, how would you like to try seven weeks? Take up thy cross and follow me. I want to tell you tonight, there is nothing glamorous about a cross. It's a cross. There's nothing that's beautiful about a cross. But there's nothing that is more glorious than a cross. I remember talking to someone not too long ago. And we were talking about ministries and ministering And we got on the subject of young men. I believe it was an elder I was talking to. And how that the time is coming when as brethren we feel that God is beginning to open the way. That's why I'm speaking to you like this tonight. That some of you younger men start and bear some of the responsibility of the church. We, none of us here, bless you, none of us here have any intentions of leaving you. I hope that I'm around to be miserable for the next 500 years because I'll likely get more miserable as years go on. Even cheese, they say, gets better with age. If you like strong cheese. But God has been very gracious over the years. There was a time when there were only the brethren. We didn't have such a thing as a traveling deacon. To that point, God hadn't really made clear what a traveling deacon was. You well remember that. But then in his wonderful love and mercy, he opened the way. He shone a little light on our pathway. He opened one of those doors before us. And thanks be to God, we went into it. Because even during this camp meeting, you have benefit from at least three of those dear brethren that God 
has added to the apostolic body. But there was a time there weren't such things as traveling deacons, but thanks be to God there are now. There was a time when we never had any what we call helpers, but thanks be to God there are now. But the responsibility of the office is going to rest on some of you young people. And God is going to require much at your hands. I want you to be prepared to bear that responsibility. I am sure that we all enjoy life. I can't hit a ball like I used to. I understand that the 29ers are going to play the 29ers and up. I would love to be with you 29ers and down. But for one reason, I don't think I could see the ball coming anymore. And the second reason, I got too much to swing. If I ever hit it, that would be it. But we love life, and we should. I have never believed that a Christian should be one that, that goes around with a long face and has no excitement in life. To me, the greatest excitement in life is being a child of God. Because God is eternally progressive. You go from glory to glory, from one horizon to another horizon. And when that, when you come to the, to the pinnacle of that experience, there is yet an eternity before you that you can go on to. I can't understand, and I'll say it, some of you young people sometimes will come along and you'll say, I'm bored to death. What are you bored to death over? Most of you got an automobile. I had a bicycle. Most of you got more money dangling around your pockets than I seen when I was a kid in all my school years. If you get a Big Mac attack, you go and have one. I used to have an, a cereal attack every night. Rice Krispies or Corn Flakes. God has been good to you. But don't get caught up in those things to the point where it robs you of your crown. There is a cross that must be borne. I think that your home should be the finest, most wonderful places on the face of God's earth. Because you have an advantage that we didn't have when we were in your position. We didn't know about the order of the home as you know it today. We've, we made it by tra trial and error. Thank God we made it. But you have, in the local church, you have such divine direction given to you that is inspired of the Holy Ghost that can save you from all of the pitfalls of this dying age in which we live. if you'll just walk in it. One of the brethren here, and I'm not here to speak on it tonight, but if there's ever been a curse on God's earth, it's women's lib and a feminist movement. I've named it so you can hang me if you like. But that thing has 
has separated families from the, from the order that God has intended for a family in 1985. I would say it and I say it kindly. I would rather go back to riding a bicycle. Now that I'm married, I'd get a bicycle built for two. And I would steer it and put my wife on the back to pedal it. <laughs> but I would rather go back to that than to have all of the luxuries of this age and lose my crown. Take up thy cross. Take up your cross and follow him. It's going to require separation from the world. There is no place. There is no way. I am sure you would be Disappointed, heartbroken, and spiritually offended. If you were to go downtown some afternoon in North Battleford and see Brother Holt coming staggering out of the Capri with a big cigar in his mouth. God requires separation. He's going to require that you refrain from doing a lot of things that is permissible in society in the world. That is, if you're going to be a pillar as I read to you from Revelation in the church. If you're going to bear the responsibility of eldership or of being a deacon, and I'll go further than that, of ministering in the local church. Take up thy cross and follow me. There is an idea, and sadly to say, I think it has crept in in some areas, into our homes. Children are the responsibility of parents. But about 90% of the care of children belongs to motherhood. Did you hear me? Somebody, I think it was Brother Holt. <clears throat> I know the feeling. If there is any way that I can postpone things and live with it for a half an hour until mama got home I'd feed them candies or anything to keep them occupied until that horrible transaction was finished there isn't such things as taking turns I don't think there's a father in this building tonight, and I say this with all due respect and kindness, that is above changing a baby's diaper. If there is, Brother Holt wants to talk to you after the meeting.
but there are things that belong in the responsibility of being a mother. And there are equally responsibilities in being a father. And I don't like to see, let me rephrase that, we don't like to see a man having to fulfill the mother's role any more than we like to see a woman having to fulfill the man's role. You are workers together. I hoover the floor when things are desperate. If somebody's driving in the driveway, I never move so fast in my life. The other day I was trying to hook up this apparatus and it has two buttons on it. <laughs> Just two. Now that had Six, I'd have had a problem. But these two buttons on the top of this instrument, <clears throat> it, it's a, one, it starts the, the, the thing, the motor running, and the, and the other one pulls the cord in, and guess which one I stepped on first? <laughs> and of course, when it's unplugged, it don't work. There's nothing wrong with a man making supper when he has to. It's the last resort for some of us. But I met a man and his wife just within the last few months where that man did actually practically everything in that home. He bought the groceries. All his wife could do is what he told her to do. That is a disorder. He wondered what was wrong. The biggest problem was him. God has ordained. I watch our little granddaughter and a lot of little girls around the campgrounds here Someone was saying the other day, when a boy picks up a doll, it might be by the leg, upside down, backwards, sticks it under its arm this way, the head out this end, feet out this end, walks along. Very rarely do you ever see a girl do that. Why? There is something that God Almighty has placed in that little innocent heart that doesn't know how babies come or anything else that no man can put there, much less take away. A woman can coddle a child in a way that a man, I almost, now you won't believe this, I almost envy you. Because there's a response that comes from a mother and her child. Very rarely did our boys or Brenda ever come in the house when they'd fallen and skinned their knee and called Daddy. Because Daddy didn't even know where the band-aids were. <laughs> Much less how to use them. I think I told you the story of being left with her once. And we had severe problems. Oh, they were severe. <laughs> we were having a wonderful time and she came and stood by my side, very quiet. Looked at me with those deep brown eyes. As if to say, Grandpa, we've got problems. <laughs> Grandpa knew that we had problems. <laughs> but I was thinking, what can we do to get out of these problems? <laughs> Where's Grandma? 
So anyway, we looked after the matter. <clears throat> I got one of these things they call, what do they call them? Not diapers, the other thing. Pampers. So I took a good look at it. And I never was much good at following directions. But there was no directions on this thing. <laughs> so bless her little heart, she lay down on the floor and she was so far away from me <laughs> that I asked her if she would mind moving up onto the Chesterfield. <laughs> so she did. And she cooperated 500%. <laughs> so I gets this thing on and turned her loose. Grandma came home and she says, what's wrong with that child's diaper? Well, it looked all right to me. It was flying half mass, but that didn't really matter. So nothing would do but that we reenact this whole scene. When she looked at it, I had it on backwards. <laughs> it was right side up, but backwards. Excuse my foolishness. But the responsibility of motherhood, hear me, young mothers, please. Never let this transitory age that we are living in rob you of the precious joys of raising your children. Take up thy cross and follow me. You young men have responsibilities in raising that young family. Don't leave everything to your wife. There's nothing that I, I suppose, dislike more than when you come home and you have to give Tommy a spanking for something you didn't see him do. But it's necessary. Discipline must be a high priority in every believer's home. I am not speaking of child abuse. I am speaking about Bible discipline. You can raise them on psychology if you like. But psychology will never do what a good slap on the behind will do. And take a lot more time to boot. That responsibility of your home is vital in the growth and the establishing of the Church of God. You may have changes that you will have to go home from this meeting and make, but I beg of you tonight, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Getting back to my conversation with this dear brother, he, I mentioned about possi the possibility of some young men maybe having to help shoulder the responsibilities of the church how they might have to move or go here and there. And he said, well, you could never expect a young man uh, to leave his 
wife and family and be gone for too many days. You did, Brother Bird. It's not a pleasant thing, but take up your cross and follow it. Why am I saying this, young people? I want you to see the glory of the office that God has for you. But there is a cross that must be borne. Some of these dear brethren, and they may really take me to task over this, but I'm going to say it. I often wonder sometimes if you really know what some of these dear brethren have had to go through over the years. Be gone for weeks on end and leave a wife with a sick child, maybe two of them or three of them. When you're in a foreign country, you just don't phone and say, come home. Because they don't know where you are, for one thing. And you just can't come home when you feel like it for another. Take up thy cross and follow me. I remember on one occasion where it really got home to me personally. I had been away for quite off and on home and then gone and home and then gone just for short periods of time. And I come home and uh, I got word that I was to go again. And I'll never forget Wendell as long as I live. He came to me and he said, Daddy, do you have to go? Can't somebody else go? No, somebody else couldn't go. Dad had to go. Take up thy cross and follow me. Young men tonight, are you willing to bear that cross? Young woman, are you willing to bear that cross? Someday you may have to. When you're making a choice of a young woman, young man, hear me. I hope that you are not just looking at the exterior. Because if my wife had done that, I'd have never been married. But there's more to making that choice of your life partner than what meets the eye. And may I say this, it reaches far beyond the physical. I do not know what I would do tonight if I didn't have a wife that understood me. And I know you'll say amen to that. My friend down here often tells her, this friend down here with the overcoat on, he says, Sister Witter, we're going to give you a little peace and quietness. We're sending your husband to Korea. But I do not know what I would do If God hadn't helped me to make the right choice, little realizing at that time what the future held, that one day we would bear the responsibility that God has entrusted to us. If I went home and she said, oh, it's you. Or when I left, there was an argument or some sort of disruption or eruption or whatever you want to call it because I was going again. 
You dear women, my heart has often gone out to you. It's been far harder on you than it has been on us. But take up your cross and follow him. But joy in fulfilling the will of God far surpasses anything else. The word of God tells tells a man that he should desire the office of a bishop or of an elder. There is nothing wrong with you desiring that office. Whether God ever entrusts you with the office or not, that is entirely up to him. But there's nothing wrong with you desiring it. I remember Brother Wager and I, I always liked the way Brother... Um, this man down here, uh, Texas, Crawford, says, Brother Wagar, keep it up, I like that, Wagar, don't ever call him Wager, or he'll get mad at you. And I remember we were in a certain place where a local church was in the making, and we knew that there were some that were striving for the office. And we knew besides that, that God never intended them to hold the office. So I thought what Brother Wager said to them, we gathered all the men together and talked to them. And he said something of this, like this to them, that every one of you should seek God concerning the office, but God will make the choice. If you are not an elder or a deacon, I'll say this kindly, maybe you should thank God. But you must desire that office. And if you're going to desire that office, you must allow the Spirit of God to make the necessary preparations in your life in your home, in everything that involves you, to bear that responsibility. We usually like to sit down with those that God seems to indicate, with the husband and the wife, and talk to them about the office. I remember Brother Wager telling me on one occasion, he talked to two couples. And after he was finished talking to them, one of them said, I didn't realize there was so much involved in being an elder. There is a lot involved in being an elder. There is a lot involved in being a traveling deacon. There are adjustments that will have to be made in your home life. When you would like to be off at the lake, zooming around on the lake, do you ever wake up Sunday morning when it's nice and bright? Not a leaf moving on the tree. And you see that old boat sitting out there alongside of the garage. What I would advise you to do is start singing, Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. It would be much easier just to hook it on behind the car and hit for the closest lake. But if you have the the responsibility of eldership, or if you are a deacon in the church, your place is there, not at the lake. Are you trying to tell me something? Speak a little louder, Mike. 
What's that? Yeah, I'm coming to that. <laughs> well, now we've got the elders and deacons straight. Now we're going to turn on the members. It can be a temptation for you, but your place is in, in the household of God. Now we believe in vacation. But if you're in a place where there is a local church, you should be there. I won't say what I'm thinking. I'll just leave that. <laughs> but there is a responsibility. I'm coming back to the members of the local church. You have actually an equal responsibility in the functioning of your ministry than what that elder and deacon have or that traveling elder or deacon. You have been taught from day one that that meeting depends as much upon you as it does upon the elders or upon the deacons or upon the brethren that may come to visit you. There are times when we may go to an assembly you will never know what a tremendous spiritual lift you can give to stand up and operate that ministry that God has given you. We leave many times with more than what we left behind. I am sure. So there is a cross that must be borne. If we're going to enter in through this door. You haven't the license, my dear young people. Hear me, please. And all of you. There is no place in the church of the living God for social drinking. We have had, not recently, thanks be to God, but I'm going to say it. We have had reports that sometimes young people have got together for one function or another and had a little wine or something like that. We would far rather you refrain from any appearances of evil. You don't need that thing to have a good time. I have never been at a, at a, I was going to call it a beer party. Well, I guess that's good enough. Yet, and I haven't any intentions of starting now. But these things are the things that will snare you. These are the things that will eventually rob you of your crown. And prohibit you. From entering into this open door. What does the scripture say? It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's standing there. He has told us. We are sure, people. I know I speak for the brethren tonight. We are sure that we stand on the threshold of the birth of a new day. What that day will hold, I could not begin to tell you. But God has told us that there is an open door. And the way I felt about it as I thought of it throughout the day and yesterday, for you young men and young women, there is that open door that is before you tonight. That I pray all the preaching that I will ever do or anyone will ever do will never bring to that, you to that point of, of, of honest decision. But I want you to realize tonight 
If you are ever going to bear the responsibility of the church of the living God, you must be willing to take up your cross and follow him. Hallelujah. You must refrain from a lot of these, these things that are in the earth. I'll tell you something else that I think is a little bit too free and easy. And that is swearing. If you want something to kind of to go by, there is no way that I could ever picture my Lord drinking whiskey, rocking and rolling, swearing, and doing all manner of evil things. I know they say damned when it's over a river, but leave it there. I've got to the place myself where I'm kind of watching even slang. Why? We've come to a place of separation. We've come to a place of dedication. We've come to a place, dear people of God, where we must sell out lock, stock, and barrel. Don't live in that gray zone. Listen to what it says. It says, I know thy works, if thou art neither cold nor hot, I would that you were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. There's nothing I despise more than a lukewarm drink of water. Either give it to me boiling or cold. Are you willing to take up that? Are you willing to bear and dis- 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 despise and shame that maybe that ministry will bring to you? Are you ready to make those adjustments in your life? We have all had to make them. I love to see progress. And I don't think it's altogether justifiable to think that everybody has to go through the things that you and I went through in order to live. It would be rather foolish As far as I'm concerned, and my wife still washed clothes with a scrub board. Anybody here that doesn't know what a scrub board is, put your hand up. Well, there's one, and he's married. I asked our son that one day, and he didn't know either. And I said to my wife, what have we raised? Well, a scrub board is a one-horse washing machine. Only your wife is the horse. And she goes scrubbing like this. Scrub, bus, scrub, bus, scrub. She sings while she does it. I wouldn't want to go back to that. But I'd much rather have that and be where God wants me than the automatic and not where he wants me. I can remember Brother York pulling into these grounds in a whole different setup of a car than what he has today. He come in once in a little minus, minor, minor is it, Morris? I think he sat in the back seat to drive it. And he had his wife and his, and his two children and their bags. 
Uh, there was more hanging on the outside of the car than inside the car. But he made it. I'm not telling you you've all got to drive an old Morris Mor- Minor, <laughs> whatever the name of the stupid thing is. But don't let these things rob you of your crown. There were times, you know, that these dear brethren here didn't know what a salary was. You may go to a place, and because of the goodness of their heart, all they could give you was $15. You had to buy your gasoline to get to the next place. And you had a wife and three children at home to feed as well. We've never had it so good. The reason I'm telling you that is there's a cross to be bought. If you want lots of money, if you want to live in the finest homes and drive the finest cars, if you set your affection on those things, you will miss what God has designed for your life. I'm not saying anything against it, like one of the brethren said the other night. If you can afford to drive two Cadillacs, a powder blue one and a pink one for your wife, that's fine with me. But don't let it rob you of your crown. Don't let it stand between you and your God. But take up your cross and follow it. There is that separation. And I'm going to touch on one more thing. I might as well throw off the whole load. It has been mentioned concerning television. And you have a button on it, which I hope you've learned to use. But I I would really, young people, think twice about the theater. You can read it on the billboard about some picture that's going to be showing in the theater downtown and it may sound good but you can never tell what's in the inside of a book by its cover I have found that out by just looking at the newsstand I really don't think there's much need for you to be spending time in these places that are so closely connected and associated with the world. It may be a good picture, but again it may not be. And if you're Scotch, You'll see it through rather than waste your money. But some of these things, I mention them to you for this reason. There is a door that stands before you tonight, as it does for every one of us here. And it's going to cost us something to go into it. I read to you here concerning the pillars of the church. I am sure that all these brethren and your elders will agree that we enjoy the company of the cream of the crop 
when it comes to young men and young women. And I am not standing here scolding you tonight, not for one moment. But I know there are things that I am have I am going to have to sincerely face if I'm going to enter into this door. And so will you. Hallelujah. Don't let the enemy rob you of your crown. Take up your cross and follow him. It'll affect your life in many ways. You may have to give up some friends. You may have to give up Someone that you're deeply in love with. But these choices you must make if you're going to follow him. Oh, you could go along and be a Christian. We were talking about this the other day. You know, we're not the only Christians in the world. I hope you know that. And as Brother Crawford ministered to us last night, there is that company upon which the Spirit of the living God rests tonight. And he is preparing for sonship. It will be different than anything else on the face of God's earth. You're queer enough now to the world. But don't let that bother you. He was despised. He was rejected. He was misunderstood. And he walked in loneliness, I am sure, many times. But there was one desire on the heart of our, of our master, and that is that he might do the will of him that sent him. That choice lies with you and I tonight. Young man, young woman, may God give you the courage to make that kind of dedication that you'll be willing to sacrifice if needs be. These temporal transitory things in order that you might fulfill the ministry that God has ordained for your life. There is nothing more gratifying, hear me, than having known that you have done the will of God. All of the praise of men could never satisfy that inward expression of his divine approval when you have fulfilled his will. I want you to think about it. I want you to pray about it. It's a serious hour that we live in. If God ever called you to be a traveling deacon, oh, you'd, as I've said, you'd think it would be wonderful traveling here, traveling there, staying in motels. I could write a book on beds. And I would fill one chapter with a water bed. I was seasick all night. 
I got into it and I couldn't get out of it. <laughs> My wife had to literally push me out of it. I slept in a bed in Seattle, Washington once. It was like the ejection seat in a jet. If you roll the right way, you were standing straight up. It had a way of, of kind of throwing you out, spewing you out. I remember being with Brother Berg at a camp meeting. They gave us a pillow. You remember that? Jacob's pillow wasn't anything like that one. When you laid down with that pillow, you were half sitting up. It was as hard as a stone. Sleep in places where little furry things pick up your false teeth and run away with them during the night. You can laugh, that's the truth. <laughs> I had to go to that place after that and I slept with the lights on. <laughs> Half chicken soup. With the head floating around in the bottom of it. <laughs> cropping all. Oh, it's wonderful. I'm preparing you for the mission field. There's nothing more glorious than doing his will. What's a few heads in the soup? <laughs> What's wrong with chasing your false teeth? <laughs> Rats have run away with them. I've often thought that would have been some rat to see the next morning. <laughs> see, can't you just see him smiling? <clears throat> Excuse my foolishness. May God help us that we may take up our cross and follow. Young men and young women, I say this sincerely on the behalf of all of the brethren and our wives. We love you with an everlasting love. And your elders, who are the appointment of God, I can assure you, have your best interests upon your, their hearts. And though sometimes they have to make decisions, which go contrary to the thing that you desire, please ask God for grace to hear what they are saying. It's very difficult to sit down with a young man I remember a young, two, a young man and a young woman coming to me a few years back. And he was part of this wonderful body that we so much enjoy. The young lady that he was thinking of marrying, they were thinking of getting married. She wasn't walking this way. She was a lovely girl, a beautiful girl. She was a Christian, no doubt about it. 
But she felt, well, she would go with him on Sunday morning, and then he would go with her on Sunday night. That will never work. Never. I felt sorry for that girl. She wept, and I could have wept with her. But I knew that the truth had to be spoken. She had to know that if she wanted a home, that would be filled with happiness and set firmly upon the foundation that God has laid. She was going to have to take up that cross and follow it. There is no way that you can mix the with the physical ideas that come from men's minds. There's no way. It won't work. You may say, well, we'll work those things out after. You better have them worked out before. There is nothing so wonderful than the plan of God. There is nothing that brings stability in a home and in your life as young people like the order of God. That order must never become bondage or it ceases to be the order of God. But we must delight to do his will. I was maybe a little hard on you young mothers. I don't want to be. But please, please, please. Don't let anyone rob you of being a mother to the fullest degree. Yeah, you may be able to have that new washing machine if you went out and worked for a while. Maybe you could take that trip to Europe and leave the children with Grandma. But the greatest investment that you have ever you will ever make is in those little tights that's at your feet right now. I remember when Marjorie Bell Beckett was knee-high to a grasshopper. She was a hopper, I'll tell you. I can remember when her husband spit right in my eye. <laughs> Held him up. He was the slobberingest kid you ever saw. <laughs> I held him up like that. And he let loose, <laughs> dead center. And I was happy to hear one day that his own boy returned the favor not long ago. <laughs> it thrills me to know that these young men and women are still with us. That in itself speaks very loudly about the order of the home. It thrills my heart when I hear your sons and your daughters prophesy. It's the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. We used to speak concerning the last days years ago. Didn't have much evidence of them being the last days, really. 
said, ah, in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will start to prophesy. Wonderful thing. Young man, young woman, do you want that gift to grow? Do you want that ministry to fulfill in you what God intends it to fill in you? And take up your cross and follow him. He requires it of us all. We have two young men here from the Caribbean that are traveling deacons that bear the responsibility of all those islands. Those same two young men will be going to Africa soon to spend six weeks to two months visiting some of the churches not in this in the big centers but back there in the backside of the desert bearing this glorious gospel of the kingdom i never find leaving home easy and the older i get the harder it becomes i thought i'd used to get used to it eventually but it seems to get harder rather than easier. There's one night in my life I always dread, and that's the night before I leave to go to Africa or wherever, where you know that you'll be gone for three, four, five, six, six months, eight months, whatever. Take up your cross and follow him. It's got to be done. Are we willing? Are you ready to bear that responsibility? We need you. God needs you. You are more than able. if you're willing to make the consecration. I hope I have not spoken in a way tonight that will sound as though I have been scolding you because I have not meant it at all for that. But I have felt in my heart for months That I would love in some way that the Spirit of God help us all to see the task that is before us and the necessity of us taking up our cross and following Him. Teach me thy ways. I would like you to stand and sing that again, if you will.
Sing it quietly again. Teach me I pray tonight that as we go to our homes, our places of rest, you may give some thought 
to that wonderful call of God that rests upon you. In closing, I'm going to ask one of the elders of one of the local churches to come and pray for you tonight. We could ask you to come for prayer, but somehow I just don't feel to do that. I hope that you'll think seriously upon what has been said. And in due time, even if it's in the privacy of your own prayer closet, that you will make that consecration and dedication to God to a degree that you've never made it heretofore. If at any time you know that the elders or us brethren can be of any help to you, we will only be too glad to spend time with you. Brother Gilbert Price, would you come, please? Just pray that God will bless these young men and women, all of us tonight, that we may fulfill his precious will. Father, this night we are so thankful to Thee for the calling that You have called us unto. Truly, it is a high and holy calling. It is a calling, my Father, that we appreciate. For, dear Lord, it's only by Thy hand we are here today. Yes. It's only by the leading of thy spirit that we're able to understand any part of the great plan that you have planned before the foundations of the world. But tonight, somehow, we feel a great calling to enter into that open door, to enter into a, a walk with thee that you have planned also that we would commit all unto thee. Nothing matters, my Father, but victory. Nothing matters but that your glory might be seen upon this body, that the glory of thy presence shall overflow each heart, O oh Lord, tonight we pray for every elder and every deacon. My Father, it is not easy for when we hear of someone being established as an elder, even though we rejoice, somehow our hearts are heavy. For we know, dear Father, that it is a calling and a commitment unto thee, dear Lord, that we will only do thy will. O oh, Father, somehow when we kneel before thee, we feel that somehow we just wonder if we have been faithful. We wonder, my Father, if we have walked in our own way that we have not been attentive unto thy voice. But tonight we lift up holy hands unto thee. And we say, Father, lead us through this open door and cause us to know thy will. Let your Holy Spirit rest upon each one. Let the glory of thy presence come that we might be moved out of our place and we might know, dear Lord, that Thou art leading us. Oh, Father, make the way plain. 
Let your Holy Spirit show us our Savior. Let the Holy Spirit reveal Christ unto us in a new and living way. That, oh, dear Father, we will love him as we've never loved him before. And we'll be able to say that we will serve him. For he is our King. He is our Redeemer. He is our Lord. Oh, God, tonight, uh, overshadow this body with thy holy presence. uh, And let everyone, dear Father, make that fresh uh, commitment unto thee. uh, Bless our young people, oh, God. uh, May you establish them in the way. uh, May they be unmovable, dear Lord. Uh, may your hand be round about them. Uh, may you put a hedge about them, O oh God, uh, and keep them by your power. Uh, bless every home, dear Lord, that's represented. Uh, every little family, O oh God. Uh, let your holy presence come upon them. Uh, let them hear the words of the Spirit this night, uh, that they might walk in the way as never before. Uh, for it is a, it is a holy walk, uh, and oh God, you said the whole world lies in the lap of the wicked one, uh, but oh Father, there is a light uh, that shineth uh, unto that perfect day, uh, and is leading us into the resurrection life. Uh, oh, hallelujah! Thy Father, it is Thy way, uh, it is Thy kingdom. Uh, oh God. God, we want to be servants uh, of the Most High this night. Uh, be with each one, O oh God, this night. Uh, oh, dear Lord, if it's thy will to keep us awake all night, uh, and just show us thy will, O oh God. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name.
if there should be any tonight that you feel you want to spend time in prayer, there is a prayer room at the back of the tabernacle here, which is always open. I said I didn't feel like calling you to come to the front tonight. I had mixed feelings, to be honest with you. But if you feel that need in your own heart tonight, you can wait on him. You can go home to your own bedroom, to your own place of rest, and let him speak to you. May God bless you. May his presence overshadow you and keep you. Good night and God bless you.